Hi, I'm Natalie Gochner. This is Both Sides of the Aisle. I represent the political center and have on the political right, Representative Ryan Wilcox. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Natalie. Good to see you again. And on the political left, Shereen Gorbani. Hello, and hi, listeners. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, I'm trying to wait for a program when we don't have to talk about former President uh, Donald Trump, but it's all over our prep sheet. I don't think that's coming soon. (laughs) I don't think it's coming soon. I don't even know where to begin, but let's talk about Trump saying that RFK Jr.'s campaign is great for MAGA. What's he talking about there, Shireen? Oh, okay. So uh, there are a number of kind of critics, I would say, in the in the political space who say that the reason that Biden was able to beat Trump, though I think there's others who would say this is not true, is because there wasn't a third party candidate. And so having a third party candidate who can peel off, even if it's some of each, right? I think the idea is that it creates a path for Trump to win. Now, my understanding is that RFK has not gotten on the ticket in every state. There's still some problems with that. But um, to be on the ballot in some key states like Michigan, Arizona, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, those that we're keeping a close eye on, could have massive impact. Yeah. Ryan, is, is there any kind of hubbub on Capitol Hill about, you know, the, uh, the potential for th- these three party you know, candidates to detract from either Trump or Biden or do Are they, we talking do they about care? Utah's Capitol Hill or yeah. Capitol Hill Capitol Utah's, Hill? Utah's, Utah's, but you can do both. You spend a lot of time in D.C., uh, so you've got half some. this month in D.C., yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, uh, on Utah's Capitol Hill, no, there's not. There's no question at all. Nobody's talking about RFK Jr. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Literally no one. Yeah, yeah. We've got also uh, the Biden administration restoring the Endangered Species Act protections that were stripped by Trump. I think I know how you're going to feel about this, Ryan. (laughs) Well, we can let you. How do you feel? (laughs) Yeah. um, You know, I haven't gone through the document to see what he was actually doing. Um, I can say that for I mean, I spent almost five years as Senator Lee's senior policy advisor for public lands, natural resources all of that. Uh, so I was neck deep in in these issues and the different species that we're talking about. Um, I can tell you this, they're a massive, massive issue in rural Utah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't affect 99% of people on the Wasatch Front at all. But when you're talking about the prairie dog or the Mexican wolf or, you know, I was really going to say the any, Mexican wolf. I'm so of, into the wolf. That's such a good one. Any of these <laughs> topics at all. What you're talking about is completely hamstringing economically, with my economist here next to me, um, major rural economies and the families that depend on access to public lands. Shereen, I remember being down at the St. George Regional Airport and seeing the little, I don't know what to call them, but little piles of dirt that were made by the prairie dogs that yeah. made them have to like redo the runway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a very visible thing in that part of the state. Well, we haven't talked about it in a while, but I'm from North Dakota, where there are so many prairie dogs. There's like a real prairie dog situation out there in Western North Dakota. Um, but I, what I think is, I, I, I totally understand and actually had numerous conversations when I was running in CD2 um, mm. with farmers down sure. Kane yeah. County, um, uh, down along our, in, in particular particular in Southern Utah. I think for me, there, there. The, what I learned in those conversations is that when you are actually in it with people who are dealing with these kinds of constraints day to day, they're really interested in the preservation of wildlife as well. When we know that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, wildlife um, extinction is happening uh, at an increased rate because of climate change, that also impacts their farming, their, you know, mm-hmm. their apparatus. So I feel like there are a lot of solutions here, but I can understand some of the, some of the frustrations when yeah. we have um, regulations around trying to keep animals well, alive. I'm sorry, but like none of those answers are from Washington. Yeah, this that's shouldn't right. have anything to do with it. This ought to be something where I can come down to North Temple, the Department of Natural Resources, to the agencies that they know and the people that they can actually talk to here on the ground to help make those decisions. To help us to figure issues. it out. Yeah, yeah, that's where those decisions ought to be made. North Temple sounds a little too urban for me, but I'm willing to listen to you. <laughs> we're, we're out almost to Redwood Road, Shireen. Yeah, okay, you know when he's saying that. It's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. I think I know, Ryan, how you're going to react to this, but um, in my policy experience, I tell people, if you think health care policy is complicated, oh yeah. uh, try public lands. Now, you play in both those worlds, but I find public yeah. lands much more difficult to make progress on than health policy. Wow. Yeah, that's a big <laughs> statement, I know, and for, to both of you, because you both have a health background. But, but for me, um, you know, how would I say it? I find health policy so frustrating, yeah. and I find public lands almost intractable. 
can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say, I think, interestingly, right, when we think about the way that people experience both these issues, though, it's pretty different. So you mentioned that for these um, in, endangered species issues, 99% of the people along the Wasatch Front may not care. Also, what, over 80% of the people in Utah live along the Wasatch Front, right? right? So when we <laughs> think about... those two factors. Right, so when we yeah. think about um, the, the amount of people that are dealing with the rising cost of health care, struggles to access health care, changes in Medicaid, whatever it may be, I think that is the part, that's the place in which I feel like healthcare is more complicated because it's so much more visceral for people day to day than mm-hmm. when we think about these kind of large land issues or, or endangered species issues. But I, I would, I mean, I haven't been as deep in, in it, mm-hmm. but I, there's, there's a lot of complications on both of the clans. <laughs> so I don't know, Martin, if you wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly health care I mean, affects everyone. Um, the public lands thing does, too. They just don't realize that it does yeah. because it's not as in your face. When, when you're talking about folks that live off the Wasatch Front in the rest mm-hmm. of Utah, it is much more so. But you're right. That population base is primarily, we are an artificially urban state yeah. because there's so much federal land condensing it all into this tiny corridor. Or maybe the water's here, just saying. That's part of it. Great great views and great cities. That's why they're there. Yeah, Yeah. but but another way that I would think of it is custom and culture. Mm. So public lands affect customs and cultures much more than healthcare. And Mm -hmm. custom and cultures are some of the most difficult things to get behavioral change on, those sorts of things. Shereen, I want to ask you, um, I think you'll have an opinion about this. Former Connecticut senator and vice presidential candidate Joe Lieberman passed away. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Any, Any thoughts from the left on that? And I'll ask you the same, Ryan. Well, so here, here's what I would say. I listened to a bunch of the news shows over the weekend. And while this isn't a person that I have a long list of um, accomplishments that I can that I can relate. What You're I just too young, you, I'll say. I probably am. <laughs> but the way that people talked about his his care, like people were deeply choked up about this. And so I think that when you have those interactions with people, especially in an environment which is, I think, as dysfunctional and toxic as we often think about D.C. as being, to have these really deep and personal connections and somebody who widely believed to be an independent thinker, going from Al Gore's vice presidential right. nominee to a very ardent John Cain supporter. And mm-hmm. and I think when you see that, it, it sort of feels like a bygone time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, I think, just a, a person who seemed to have a lot of heart. Yeah, a little bit of reflection here, Ryan, and you're probably too young for this, too. But McCain wrote in his memoir that he was sorry he didn't choose Lieberman as his vice presidential candidate over Sarah Palin. And this is super interesting to me because it shows this connection between these two senators from both sides of the aisle. But also, you don't hear uh, presidential candidates uh, say they made the wrong pick on their VP very often. And uh, when I first heard Sarah Palin, I was in Japan when she gave her speech at the Republican convention. And I was knock. I mean, she was fabulous. Mm -hmm. But then as I watched her, I I grew more skeptical. But your your comments. Well, Lieberman in general, I'll just say this. I, you know, I grew up as a child of the 80s when I started paying attention to the world around me. And, you know, my mother would say that I would... Anytime President Reagan would speak from the Oval, he would, I would be sitting in front of it, um, just soaking it up. None of my siblings joined me <laughs> in this. Apparently, that was just a me thing. Okay. But you know, I was raised on Orrin Hatch and Ronald Reagan and all of that. And watching those guys talk about, you know, working with Tip O'Neill, working with uh, Senator Kennedy at the time, uh, with Orrin, and watching those relationships, I expected that that's what I would find as an adult. Mm-hmm. And, you know, back to, I think, when I, I think it was first a delegate in 2000, right? As a young man, started watching these things closer. By the time I worked in Congress, and I remember my first day in the Senate, I just wanted to see the Senate floor from the Senate floor. Mm-hmm. So I have the magic badge now, and I'm going up there. Senator Menendez was giving a speech uh, from New Jersey, and he, you know, his passion, I could see him on the monitors as I'm nearing the entrance, and going, I'm excited to see, and I get onto the floor, and he's literally talking to no one. (laughs) Of course. He was gesturing to the cameras all over the place, (laughs) as if he was having a debate with his colleagues next door. The week before, like I had been on the House floor in Utah, where if you actually give a great speech, you're going to sway 17 votes, and it changes the course of history. Mm -hmm. The greatest deliberative body in the world was a quote I would always hear from Warren Hatch, 
it does not exist anymore. <laughs> They're all and in their that's, offices that's watching it on I TV, miss. right? That's what I yeah. miss. I longed for that. Yeah. So I've studied Lieberman more. I watched him in the 2000 race. I watched him in 08 and 12. Mm-hmm. You know, how cool would that have been if there had been the same guy on one party that was the vice on presidential the nominee for the other? Would have been fascinating. Um, but that only existed because they had created this relationship with one another where they could. There Over was some time. space to do that. It doesn't exist now. Yeah. Not in D.C. Shereen, I'd love to hear you comment really quickly on um, President Trump's reaction to Ronna McDaniel's NBC uh, firing. Oh, geez. Well, I, I think we know that there's not a lot of love lost between Ronna and Trump. So I, I, I feel like we're just going to see news cycle after news cycle again, where he continues to really um, say inappropriate things and disparage people for, for the work that they have done. Um, but basically... Um, I don't know. I just I this is exactly what he's like. He he will just continue to demean people, belittle people. I, I think the hiring of her is that seemed to have gone poorly in many, many different ways. Um, but this is just who he is. Yeah. I think that's the wrong focus. It's back to the mean tweet concept. Like I don't know that I care as a conservative about the mean tweets. What I'm more worried about is that we have this artificial you know, censorship. This isn't a person who the, the political right and certainly not Trump voters see as their standard bearer. But she was too far right for our major institutions to even have a voice over the air. That's the bigger problem for me. So different reporting on this has suggested something else was going on as well, which is that, or I guess I should say instead, but I, I'm sure that you have sources for that as well, but that really typically in the past when people have been brought on to a network, there are high level meetings with many of the major talking heads of, of that station. Sure. That didn't happen at all in this case. So how you would expect that this would be set up for success feels like a real debacle from the beginning. You She's mean someone... that eight out of the ten Democrats in the room didn't like the idea that they hired a Republican? Well, we let you come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is not NBC. <laughs> it's public Ryan, radio. Is she someone you've met before? Is she someone you know or have met before? Who? Ronna McDaniel? No. Okay. Just curious, not giving you roles. Hey, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Natalie Gochner with Shereen Gorbani and Ryan Wilcox. Stay tuned. Shereen Gorbani on the left. And Ryan Wilcox on the right. Natalie Gochner in the political center, and this is both sides of the aisle. I'm excited to chat with you two on this segment. Uh, let's start with uh, Senator Mitt Romney, who's expressed concerns about the reclassifying of marijuana. I don't know all the classifications mm-hmm. and things, but I do know that there is a movement afoot to change it from what, a schedule one? Is that what they call it? Oh, geez. I, I don't know if I'm going to get those parts of the classification correct. But what I can say is that we had some interesting connections to, and perhaps you can speak to this, Ryan. Um, but the one of the things that's really difficult, of course, there are many people, including myself, who believe we should have way fewer people in our criminal legal system because of weed. And this would be a big part of that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also a huge part of it that's related to research. It's really difficult to understand and get the kind of research or funding for understanding the the medical benefits and how that works. And then there's a whole other complication where we have medicinal marijuana, but there are many constraints around Mm -hmm. the cash and the way that... um, Profit moves around it because it is a, a scheduled drug. It's it's yeah. a it's a classified drug. So I know that we had I, I believe that we had some movement on this for psychedelic around mushrooms in our legislature this year. I don't know, Ryan. Do you have anything to add on? <laughs> Um, we don't normally the, talk the, about drugs on this program, but no, sure, here, that's right. all right. Yeah. <laughs> Our research. I mean, look, so marijuana right now is a Schedule One drug, right, which requires you know specific federal. Uh, intervention or, or direction in order to even study uh, what's happens with the drug. Um, moving it to a Schedule 2 or even there's been suggestions that if you follow the schedule guidelines for what a drug does, it should probably be a Schedule 3, which would put it in the same category as like ketamine, for example, right? Which, um, I mean, honestly, uh, so there's, there's probably, depending on the question, my own personal political view um, is that you know, we do, I don't know that we should be at this point, especially where the states have taken this 10th Amendment stance and done whatever they wanted to do anyway. Isn't it crazy? Because yeah. it <laughs> like, states we... legalize it. Federal government still hasn't. And we're just sort of in the in between. It's tough. It yeah, we're just a lot of complications there. from the health care standpoint. Like, I mean, we have physicians right now all over Utah who are dispensing, who are you know, providing scripts for uh, medicinal marijuana. 
Um, we have seen in states surrounding Utah and in the Washington and sort of a disaster with this, um, you know, full deregulation has also has consequences. Sure. But not I mean, that's not just what you're referencing is not just marijuana. Not just marijuana. No. It's a lot right. of stuff. Yeah. And we're yes. seeing many different implications, I think, economically and otherwise in places like Colorado that have taken a different approach. So the policy question really for me on this schedule, and this I, this should allow us to study this, to study the outcomes, frankly, and without this sort of arbitrary federal, you know, foot on the scale. I'll stay true to the political middle and support my Senator Romney and what he's doing here. But more than, you know, I don't know this issue well, but I will say a couple of quick things. One, I do see it as a gateway drug. And that does concern me that anything that makes it more accessible or available, um, I think will have, um, you know, bad impacts on society. Second point I'll make is I hate what it's done in Colorado, just the recreational oh, yeah. marijuana thing, what it's done to their workforce. Uh, I don't think it's been a positive. And, you know, everyone likes to get it out of the darkness and, you know, tax it and, you know, make it that way. But but when you have a workforce that's high, it's not good for your economy. Okay, I'll just add. I'll just add. <laughs> I got a laugh out of you there, I mean, Ryan. No, yeah. I, I experience there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't get into that on this one. But I also just want to add, I think a lot, we have to add that there have been people whose lives have been dramatically improved by access to medicinal marijuana. Yeah. And when we think about the comfort and, and relief that it can provide to cancer patients mm -hmm. I've seen up close, um, there's a lot of opportunity for good there as well. Yeah, good with the medicinal. Hey, so we also had Matt Gates, who not only attacked our representative, John Curtis, but he did a campaign stop and endorsed Riverton Mayor Trent Staggs. He did. That's pretty big news, Ryan, you know, getting... Yeah, I saw Matt Gates last week. Okay, tell us more. Yeah, yeah tell us what, what's he like. Give us the rundown. You know, interesting guy. Uh, has nothing to do with his policies or anything. That's just, just my experience meeting the guy. Um, it, it's a weird choice, I suppose. But there is, you know, honestly, there's certain delegates who, have, you know, obviously the campaign, Mayor Stagg's campaign, thinks that that's a yeah. a winning voice to help him. I but, loved this uh, quote that was provided to us by our producer: "John Curtis is Mitt Romney without good hair." Oh. So this is Matt Gates saying that about John Curtis. And uh, I think Mitt Romney gets so much attention for his good hair. He really does. His hair is great. <laughs> his hair it's is great. great. Hair. And John Curtis doesn't have much hair. That's right. So Matt Gates knows exactly where to you know, put the knife that's, that's in. That's so stupid. <laughs> it right. is that stupid. Is so stupid. <laughs> it I, is stupid. There are uh, plenty of legitimate reasons to criticize any person in public life. Um, you know, pick pick any of those policies that you don't like, or he's too environmentally focused, or he's you know not enough focused on X, Y, Z, whatever it is that you want. Um, what a stupid comment. Yeah. 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 Shereen, yeah. we have, in, having Ryan on the program is fun because he has insights into Senator Lee. And Senator Lee gets a lot of mentions on this program, sometimes not real positive, I'll just yeah. say. But, but also sometimes we agree. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, also he's a surprise really, well, about so him. So that's my point on this one. So he has now... Uh, signing up with Dick Durbin, so someone from the right, someone from the left, to protect Americans from unwanted government surveillance uh, while keeping the country safe. Hallelujah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, Ryan, this is a, tr you know, some things you love about Mike Lee, sometimes you don't like about Mike Lee, but this is one of the things he does frequently is he he, he sides. This is normal in that he, office. Yeah, he, like he does unconventional of, of things. that he runs with. Bernie Democrat, Sanders. Freaking Bernie Sanders, which <laughs> yeah. would blow everyone's mind, right? Yeah. We worked all the time with Bernie Sanders and, you know, um, oh, what's his name from New Jersey? I'm forgetting the other senator, not Menendez, the other one. Oh, um, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I know. Corey. Booker. Booker. Sorry, yep. thank you. Yeah. He does a lot I with Senator Booker. I shouldn't refer to him by his first name. Sorry, Senator yeah. Booker. Yeah, but, but he's but, not a listener. But that's that's interesting. You would know that from a staff perspective, but he he's a, Lee, from my read, uh, Senator Lee's a principled guy that holds to his principles almost to a fault, which that's a statement, like, what am I talking about? But he's so anti, you know, deficit spending that he won't support yeah. really good projects in Utah. So mm, that yeah. unnerves me. Just, I totally get that. But <laughs> is, and honestly, as a staffer, it was awesome. We always knew what his position was before we even had the conversation with him. <laughs> right. And frankly, a lot of our Western senators, our counterparts in other states, even in Arizona with Republican delegations and Colorado, and you just never knew. 
Yeah. You never knew where they like were Like this be. infrastructure bill, Shireen, that's yeah. going to do so much good for our state, he voted against. Yes, that's and, right. And it unnerved Senator Romney because he was a big part of negotiating it. But when you see some great things happening with rail and transit and roads, bridges, yeah. that isn't Senator Lee. That's Senator Romney. Yeah, that's right. I guess the thing that concerns me about that is I think there's one thing about just sort of um, – whatever, catching the direction of the wind, like however things are blowing, that's the way you go. Like we don't want people who are so easily moved that there's no real center to their ideology. But I also am concerned when people have never changed their mind. Right. So I I hope that there's always space for that opportunity to think and grow. Even if you are ideologically pretty set, it feels like in a changing environment and a changing world with changing information, we would want our leaders to be able to, to be responsive in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, of course. Yeah. And you know, again, um, there's a, Mike Lee, the, the man, the senator, and then there's Mike Lee, the caricature. And most of what I see him portrayed as in Utah, and have from the beginning, is the caricature. Mm-hmm. It's not, most of it's not even accurate, um, but, you know, whatever. It's more fun to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I love your point because we should be thinking about people's character, not their caricature. Now, with so President me- Trump... They seem to be about the same. Because <laughs> it's a completely different thing. That's a tough one. Go there. That's okay, a tough one. But, okay, I'll give you an example. I had a physician that was testifying in Congress two weeks ago, and he wanted to see, you know, what was, you know, what it was like. We had a little bit of a break, and at that moment, Senator Lee happened to be on the Senate floor giving a speech. He's arguing for just like general subject area passage mm-hmm. of legislation. So that they're somewhat related. So the public, so that citizens, let alone senators, that morning, that day, they had released the funding package at 2.30 in the morning and they were voting on it the next day. It was physically impossible to have read, let alone study and understand. So Shireen, none of us in this room could possibly could have read and said, given our feedback to our senators or our congresspeople to vote on it. It is absolutely criminal how they handle that process right now in D.C. And so Senator was measured. He gave his comments. And I don't know how the press covered it in Utah that day, but I've heard it in the past. (laughs) And it's it's not. No, he's not just a stick in the mud obstructionist. He's saying the process does matter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Shereen, I got to ask you about something. Uh, Governor Cox has been going all around the state these days uh, doing ceremonial bill signings. Maybe you've seen some of these. And and anybody who knows what's going on is his bill signing period has ended. They're done. These are ceremonial. Yep. March 20th was the deadline. Yeah. These are a show. And I'm curious, do you you like that? Is that okay with you? So, well, I was going to say, this actually kind of ties to the Mike Lee thing. Oh, Um, good. I didn't know how to make a connection. I think when, I think it's good for people to show up in more places. Mm -hmm. When you have the opportunity to be out in new places, to gather in different spaces, because so often, I think especially for most Utahns, the sense that you could even go into the Capitol and like walk around doesn't, it, especially during the legislative session, it doesn't really feel like it's mm-hmm. their house, even though it is, it's your house. Go, go in. <laughs> Everyone should yeah, go yeah. in. Um, but I think when we see people out in public, then you have that that opportunity to have more connection and really see them as a human being, yeah. which I think increases our sense of dignity. And I'll say for my little run around in Congressional District 2, I really didn't see like Mike Lee as present as some of the others. And I get that when you have districts, you have districts and you show up there and when you have the state, it's more complicated. But I think the more that people who represent you can show up in community and be seen and be interacted with, the better. Your quick comment as a legislator on ceremonial bill signings, they, they have this yeah. performative thing to it where the sponsors come and then the the governor gives them the pen. And, sure. and, and it's, but it's fake. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say this. And, and I actually, ironically, when I met you, when I saw you today, I was on the phone with the governor's advisor about a ceremonial bill sign. <laughs> okay. okay. About school security. Yeah. And I'll say I'll say this. Um, early in my political life, I ran a bill on unlawful detention, as it was called. It was really kidnapping of a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. It's the case that came out of Weber County. (sighs) Terrible case. And we couldn't prosecute for the kidnapping um, because of the existing law and the way it was structured. The girl ended up being trafficked. She was uh, assaulted, raped, all the things that you hope would never happen um, in Utah County. We found her because we pinged her cell phone when it turned on for two seconds. Mm. And then sent local law enforcement in as soon as we had that from the Weber County Sheriff. Took her in. We got we got the bill signed. We were able to tell the story without having her come testify, mm-hmm. um, without having to expose the family to anything else. 
three weeks, a month after, we met at a under construction charter school where they could where they could get to. And the governor Her- Herbert at the time came in and signed it. We didn't tell anyone who she was, but that little girl was standing right behind me. Mm. Right, and mm-hmm. when the governor turned to hand that pen that he had just signed, did not it doesn't do anything for her. It doesn't help her. It doesn't do any of those things, but it helps us to prevent and to hold accountable the people that did this to her for the next girl. Becomes part of the public message. It, it, We've it got mattered. to end it there. Yeah. Uh, but thanks for the story, Ryan yeah. Wilcox on the right, Shereen Gorbani on the left. Programs produced by Anthony Scoma. Thanks everyone for listening.